Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Australian Space Discovery Centre's digital Q&A. My name is Nathan. I am a space communicator here at the Discovery Centre. Uh, we're located in uh, Lot 14 in Adelaide. Uh, so if you're in South Australia, please come along and join us. We have a wonderful centre in here. We talk about space. We have some fun gallery exhibits uh, that you can uh, interact with as well. Uh, for those of you that aren't in Adelaide, think about a trip down here maybe to visit us, but otherwise you get to join us online uh, with our digital Q&A sessions. And I'm really excited today uh, to have uh, Stephen Freeland uh, with us. He is a, a space expert, a space law expert. His um, uh, credentials are very long and very impressive. And I'll just give you some of them. Uh, he's an emeritus, um, emeritus professor of international law at Western Sydney uh, University, uh, previously the dean, where he was previously the dean of the School of Law, uh, and he's a professorial fellow at Bonn University as well. Uh, he had spent 20 years uh, working in uh, international commercial law and as an investment banker. He's been a, a member of the Australian Space Agency Advisory Board, uh, has represented the Australian government um, at uh, um, peaceful uses of outer space meetings, uh, has represented Australia at the United Nations, um, and in 2022 he was presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Inter Institute of Space Law, which is the highest accolade awarded by that institution. Um, uh, do I call you Professor Freeland, um, <laughs> or, or, is, or is Stephen okay? Stephen's absolutely fine, please. Thank okay, I, I feel like it. I feel like it should be a sir in front of that. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today, Stephen. It's a true pleasure to have you with us today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your, your story, your background, and, and how you got to where you are today? Absolutely. And firstly, thank you so much to the uh, agency and the Discovery Centre for the invitation. I've been to the Discovery Centre a few times, uh, particularly when I was on the advisory board of the agency. And what you do there is extraordinary. So I just echo what you say. Everybody should make a visit down there. Um, so I'm a uh, I'm an international lawyer. Um, I do uh, a lot of work on a whole range of issues, but a lot of my work now is to do with space. And space is just one of those incredibly interesting and multifaceted things that allow you to explore any and every aspect of uh, what you're interested in, because everything is relevant for space and space is relevant for everything. And I know that sounds very cliched. So I've been a, a I've had various careers. I've been an actor, uh, then I was a lawyer, then I was an investment banker, then I was an academic, and now I have the joy of uh, working for myself, but I represent Australia at the UN. I've done a lot of work for many countries writing their laws and their strategies and their policies. I've been appointed by the UN to chair 105 countries to try to work out additional rules for space. And I just have a lot of fun. I mean, it's just wonderful. And I'm also delighted to have been part of the growth uh, from the governance viewpoint and the regulation viewpoint of the Australian space economy. Um, I was asked by the government and revised the previous space law we had, which gave rise to the amendments for the law we have now. And it's just great to see momentum. It's great to see interest in space. It's great to see podcasts like this because, you know, the more people who know about the wonders of space, we can't keep it as a secret anymore, the better. So it's great to be here. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And we wholeheartedly agree that the more people that, that know about space, and uh, we often talk to people that come into the centre here uh, about space technology, and people don't realise they use it every single day, uh, not just for things like GPS and, and Google Maps, but for FPOS even. Um, people use space technology every single day, and um, I think it's important that 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 we get that word out there that, uh, you know, space is for everybody and the technology, it's not just about sending stuff up there. It's about helping us back here on earth as well. Um, I, I agree. I agree. Just to say that in every, you know, I, I often say that space touches every person on the planet and people mm -hmm. look at me and go, you know, surely he's not right, but it is correct because space, as you say, is an integral part of our life. It's an integral part of every community, every society, every economy, every country. And there have been, Nathan, you probably know, theoretical sort of projections about what our world would look like in a day without space. Mm -hmm. And literally, 
we would be back in the dark ages. Mm. All of our all of our systems would collapse. We couldn't have this conversation. Mm-hmm. People couldn't be watching. So I, I, you know, space is wondrous and amazing. And but more people should know about how crucial it is, and therefore how as we move forward in the activities we do, how we have to be careful to respect what we're doing in space to make sure that essentially we don't. Um, uh, mean that it becomes unsustainable. A hundred percent. And that, that is something I want to touch on later um, because a lot of people think that space, it's, you know, it's so far out there, it doesn't really have anything to do with us. But um, as you said, it, it touches the lives of every single person on the planet. Um, and how we use space sustainably is a very very important uh, issue, um, especially moving forward with the increasing number of launches and satellite deployments. And as comes with that, the increasing amounts of space debris, space junk that is up there as well. Absolutely. Uh, which, mm, which is only just one part of it though, because there are other interesting parts of space law as well. But can you just give us a bit of a breakdown on what exactly is space law and why do we need it? Oh, it's a great question. Well, as you said, um, space is part of the fabric of everything that we do in our in our lives from transportation to financial transactions to weather forecasting to satellite tv to communications to our sewerage system to our military and national security i mean all of that and much 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 more and so that's the the same for many countries and clearly because it's so important it's so strategic it has a bearing on every country's uh, economies and functioning. It has a bearing on every person. We therefore clearly need to have rules of the road because if we don't have rules of the road that are broadly complied with around the globe, then we really run serious risks of meaning that space becomes inaccessible and unsustainable. And as I said, that would be a disaster for humanity. We've already touched upon debris, so we need rules about debris. Uh, I've mentioned that space is important for national security and even military operations on Earth. We therefore need rules about that. Space is important for the development of weather forecasting and communications. So we need rules to govern and allow for that to happen. Space is about, you know, future ambitions for perhaps resource exploitation, um, which, and I'm chairing all the meetings at the UN looking at those rules. So we'll need rules about that. We need rules about every facet of the way we engage with space to ensure that firstly, as many people as possible have access to the benefits, and we, at the same time, maximizing those benefits, we minimize risks. And as you know, Nathan, and everybody knows, space is a risky thing. You know, there are always risks, but, uh, you know, all we can do as we develop frameworks and regulations or governance and guidelines and practices is to maximize benefits, minimize risks, so that we and future generations going many generations forward will have that ability not only to uh, gain benefits from space, but also enjoy the wonders of what space is. And so law is crucial as part of a broader package to as much as possible mean that we can all enjoy space. Of course, you know, there are problems, there are many challenges, but without rules of the road, we would be in a far, far worse position than we are now. Mm, very well put, very well put. Um, you spoke about some of the laws across different industries and also across different countries. Um, so I, I want to um, touch on both of those. I guess, first of all, with industries, um, are the space laws related to the terrestrial laws for that industry, like, for example, communication or something like that? Or is there something um, extra that is required because it is off world? That's a really great question, and it's a it's a combination of both. So, in communications, in broadcasting, there are clearly 
Australian national laws that deal with broadcasting and communication rights and all of those sorts of issues. But because in engaging in those activities, you're also utilising satellites and space technology, um, we need also to factor that in. And so without going into too much detail, there's a mm -hmm. broad body of international law. Um, Australia is a party to all of the five international treaties that you know, give the fundamental principles of how space activities are to be conducted. Those activities bind all of the countries, right? They have rights, they have obligations, but part of, you know, there's a suite of obligations, but part of the obligations for, let's say, Australia is not only if Australia as a sovereign were to do something in space, but if an Australian national or somebody under the jurisdiction of Australia were to engage in space, if Nathan Wildey was going to send up a satellite, uh, one, you'd have to get the appropriate licence from the Australian Regulatory Authority, in, in our case, the Space Agency. But secondly, Australia uh, has a responsibility to make sure that whatever you do is in accordance with the fundamental principles that that are agreed at this treaty level. So even though in a technical sense, you're not bound by a treaty, Australia is, and Australia is required to make sure that what you do makes sense. And so um, it's really, really important that we have international law and then to bind and make sure that Nathan Wildey Inter Enterprises does the right thing countries then have national law because the national law is where they regulate those within its jurisdiction and they bring those obligations that they have under the treaties they put them in the national law they say nathan you want to go, you want to go to space these are all the preconditions you've got to satisfy us on a whole range of things that you're doing the right thing you're the right person etc cetera, etc cetera. and um, I've had the privilege of writing the national laws of about 20 countries and helping with the reformation of the Australian law. And so you have international law governing space, but when the private sector is involved, when Nathan Wildley Incorporated is involved, we also need countries to have laws. And so it's a mixture of both. And it works reasonably well, but as you know, the technology is changing all the time. And of course, law can never keep up with that. But we have to, as much as possible, make sure that we have systems in place to make sure that everybody is acting in the most appropriate way possible. Well put. And um, the idea of me putting a saddle up, up into space is a very <laughs> intriguing one. <laughs> well, good, I, good I might get some tips that. from you. <laughs> good, good, luck, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's impressive that you've worked with uh, uh, 20 countries to help develop their national laws. So from my understanding of it, all of the countries have to follow these international treaties. Do, do all of the countries follow the treaties or have some not signed on to them? Virtually every country that's a faith-bearing nation has at least at, uh, become a party to the fundamental, the first of these treaties, which we affectionately call the Outer Space Treaty. There's only one mm -hmm. spacefaring nation that is, has not become a party, uh, but rather a signatory, and there, there is a difference, and that's Iran. Mm -hmm. But Iran has said, you know, and I go to all the UN meetings, Iran has said that they follow the Outer Space Treaty. It's just for internal purposes. They haven't ratified it. So mm -hmm. virtually every spacefaring nation is bound by those principles, but mm -hmm. it's got a lot more countries that have signed on to it than at the moment have their own capabilities. So oh, that's because, cool. because space is so relevant for everyone you know at, at the moment you could probably say about 80 or 90 countries have some form of sovereign capability as australia does you know obviously at different levels but that also means that perhaps 110 countries don't have any sovereign capability and yet they are dependent on space and so mm. space also builds cooperation and alliances and dependencies and we're going to utilize your technology with your agreement etc so it actually is one of those areas albeit there are there are issues it's actually one of those areas that encourages cooperation there's also competition. I mean, that's the nature of the world we live in. There's also geopolitics. That's the nature of the world I operate in the UN. But space is one of these magical things that, you know, even in the most tense geopolitical times, 
you still see cooperation. You know, you're still seeing, for example, uh, the Russians and the Americans and other countries cooperating at the moment as we mm. speak in the International Space Station, notwithstanding everything that's going on. So it is quite an extraordinary area, as well as being critical for the future of humanity. So it it has the propensity to encourage the best of us. And what we need to do is keep on encouraging the best of our of the way we operate. And as I say, minimize the risks of sort of other types of activities that would perhaps be detrimental. Mm. We, we often talk here in the center about how space is for everybody. And there seems to be a pretty good cooperation and collaboration by all countries uh, around the world when it comes to space. Space is for everyone. And, and so it should be that way. Um, so very, very happy to, to, to hear that. Um, what are some of the challenges when it comes to space law? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that question very broad to start with. What are some <laughs> of the challenges that come with space law? Well, from a general uh, general point, and, and as I already said, the technology is changing so fast. Mm. Law can the law can never keep up because if you think, oh, I've caught up with technology, this is the law, then something will change again. So mm. we need, you know, the, one of the challenges, and I'm involved. You know, I have the privilege of being involved in working with countries, working with governments to work out what the laws should be for future activities. But to a certain degree, even though you need to create those frameworks, you are regulating for the unknown because things mm. change. We don't exactly know what things might look like. So that's that's an overarching challenge. But yet we do it and we move on and the laws we've created have served us well and they've meant that notwithstanding all of the changes and since Sputnik in 1957, and I was born in 1957, I'm a Sputnik baby, so uh, <laughs> it, it, notwithstanding all of those incredible changes in technology and activities, etc., space by and large has worked and that's because the frameworks we have have fundamental principles that make sense, but allow for flexibility as we move forward. The challenges in a more specific level are, and you talked about it already, probably our greatest challenge is the environment of space, space debris. We literally have hundreds of millions of pieces of debris in Earth orbit. The fact that they're in Earth orbit means that each one of those pieces of debris are traveling at extraordinary speeds. That to be able to stay in orbit, notwithstanding the gravitational pull of the Earth. And therefore, if it, it goes logically that if two objects, be they alive or dead, so to speak, collide, they will destroy each other, given the, the, the velocities that they're going at, creating more debris. Mm. More debris creates more collisions. More collisions create more debris. And so we run a risk now of... If we're not careful, if we continue on a sort of business as usual idea, and so my mantra is we have to change our thinking about space. But if if we continue as we're going, we run a risk that this cascading effect, um, it's called uh, the, the Kessler Ke syndrome, Kessler syndrome, named after mm -hmm. Donald Kessler, who wrote about it already in the 70s and 80s, that at some point that will mean we can't utilise space in the way that humanity needs to thrive and continue to develop. And so debris is a major issue. Militarization of space is a major issue. Of course, the reality is that at, along with so many other things, space is also crucial for national security interests and uh, military interests on Earth. Uh, the Australian Defence Force, for example, would never engage in any sort of activity without access to space technology. That's a given, you know, whether or not that's that's ideal, that is the nature of things. But what we need to make sure is that this that the militarization doesn't turn into something more like a weaponization of space. Major challenge. You know, we need to continue to prevent what there, there's movement at the UN called PAROS, prevention of an arms race in outer space. We need to continue to work on that. In fact, I argue we need more. I argue we need actually a peace race in space. So, you know, I, I push for that. So that's the challenge. Um, dealing with uh, different types of constellations of large, uh, of, of large numbers of satellites in orbits that are popular is a major challenge because 
firstly, that of course increases the ability, uh, the, the, the propensity for uh, collisions, but secondly, it changes the nature of space where everybody has a right of freedom of access. It's this area that we classify, even though it's not called this efficiently, as a, a, a global comet. So you and I can go to space as long as we adhere to various rules. But um, if we're sending up, you know, hundreds of thousands of objects, one, we begin to crowd popular orbits. But secondly, of course, the more we send up there, the more the risks of collision continue to grow. And so dealing with that, dealing with future activities. So there's a great excitement now about uh, the possibility of uh, exploiting, let's say, water and water ice on the moon and other celestial bodies. Everybody's very excited about that. Again, you know, there are many technical challenges. There are moral, ethical, indigenous perspectives that we need to take into account. And I've been charged with sharing the, the 105 countries to work out rules moving forward on that. It's a major challenge because... That's a big job. Yeah, many people have completely different perspectives but the main challenge is really for us to make sure that we hear all of the voices of space not mm -hmm. just as i say the loudest voices in the room mm -hmm. but all the voices because space is so wondrous that it's about culture and religion it's about science it's about economics it's about exploration it's about national security it's about indigenous perspectives it's about so many things and as we move forward, reacting to the change of the technology, working out that we need to continue to promote safety and security and stability and sustainability, we need to make sure we hear all of the voices uh, in those frameworks. And, uh, you know, that is a challenge as well, because not all those voices are loud and we have to make sure that we hear them all. There was a, a lot to unpack in that answer, and it was a broad <laughs> question that I asked. So thank you for giving such a detailed um, response. You're, you're welcome. Um, I'm going to go back to one or two of them, um, and I think I'll probably organise this by um, moving from the ground up, so to speak. Um, speaking about uh, militarisation and weaponisation, uh, are there any rules that there can't be space-based weapons? Absolutely. Um, so there are specific rules that specifically prohibit the placement in Earth orbit of certain types of weapons, so nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. But yeah. there's a lot more that the treaty law says that also impacts on the on on the idea of putting weapons in space or militarizing space, uh, you know, unacceptably. So as yeah. I said, there's freedom of access. There's an emphasis on peaceful purposes. There's an emphasis on cooperation. There's a responsibility of states to ensure that everything that is done meets with certain principles. There's a liability regime. There's so much to be said in the treaties that, you know, when somebody comes to me and says, well, I can put any weapons in space apart from the ones that are specifically prohibited in the treaty, mm -hmm. that's you know, that's a reading for convenience sake mm. of just one or two or three paragraphs. But if you read the whole totality of the way space was structured and the treaty and everything around it and the way that it's spoken of, there are restrictions. But it's true to say that there is no uh, comprehensive expression banning all weapons. There have been mm. attempt, attempts by some countries to introduce that, and those are ongoing, but uh, that's where geo geopolitics comes in, which is very mm. sad. And my job is to try to assuage those geopolitics and make sure that everybody understands, which is true, that even if you and I don't like each other, Nathan, even if we compete, even if we don't necessarily cooperate, we actually have much more in common in ensuring that space continues to be accessible so you can get on with what you want to do and I can get on with I, what I want to do. And so we actually have a lot in common, even if we don't like each other. And mm -hmm. that's the that's what I'm trying and others, of course, at that multilateral level to get people to look not at their differences when it comes to space, but look at the far more pressing common interests that they have as mm -hmm. we move forward. Yep. 
Mm, I like that. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some polar orbits and, and Kessler syndrome. Uh, so for our listeners, Kessler syndrome uh, is this concept that uh, as more space junk, space debris um, exists, that increases the likelihood of more collisions, thus compounding the problem, leading to more space junk, more collisions, and it's a, a snowballing effect. Um, Excuse me. Um, we talked about polar orbits, though, and we often talk in centre here that it's not just physical space, but also bandwidth when it comes to satellites in orbits. What happens, oh, sorry, not polar orbits, popular orbits. What happens when these popular orbits start getting full and we start running out of space? Well, in theory, uh, you know, you probably can't fill an orbit so that, that there's absolutely, you know, there's a, a queue and a log jam. But in practice, of course, um, in uncertain orbits, and so there's an, a, a wonderful orbit uh, about 36,000 kilometres above the Earth called geostationary orbit. I'm sure you're aware, Nathan, and I'm sure many of our listeners are, um, that uh, there are, in a sense, depending on where you want to cover with your, with your footprint of your satellite, there are good spots and bad spots. Mm -hmm. And so it's not so much meaning there's, no room whatsoever, it's mm. in that particular orbit working out where you want to be. There's no point mm. in Optus putting a geostationary satellite um, somewhere where it can't reach Australia and New Zealand, which is, of mm. course, where they want to operate. So the, in geo, therefore, that is very much regulated by the United Nations. In that case, there's a body called the International Telecommunication Union. In other orbits, which don't have the same qualities of uh, as, as GEO, but are extremely popular, particularly in low Earth orbit, we are seeing a crowding. We are seeing in polar, in, in, in uh, orbital planes of between about, let's say, 400 kilometres to about 600 kilometres above the Earth. So in low Earth orbit, we're seeing more and more and more satellites. Just to give you some numbers, and numbers are always telling. Since the day I was born, remember I was mm -hmm. born in 57, humanity has probably launched, I don't know, maybe 10 to 12,000 satellites into Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. Out of that, we've created hundreds of millions of pieces of debris. If the well-publicized plans of countries and companies over the next 10 years come to fruition, we're looking at literally three, four, five hundred thousand more objects in space. So twelve thousand in in my lifetime, sixty seven mm -hmm. years, hundreds of thousands in the next ten years. And of course, wow. you know, there'll be small satellites, there'll be you know, but we are crowding at particular areas with those constellations. Mm -hmm. And you know, whilst there will always be room to put a satellite in one sense, a small satellite, um, you are increasing the hazards, increasing the risks. And of course, it only takes one or two or three things to go wrong. Mm. And that creates, as you say, this cascading snowballing effect, which would be a disaster for humanity. So mm. we need to change the thinking. And that's what I said, you know, in, in if, if we go with business as usual, then and and we look at space even though there are global laws every country is trying to maximize its own interests mm -hmm. if we look at it with that thinking if regulators in one particular country have their own national laws and they'll allow you know these constellations to go up as long as they can tick the various boxes and they've satisfied the national laws if we do that then we do run risks and so we need to sit down and have a holistic view about space but of course that meets the challenge because it's a bit like the climate change debate. If you say that, hey, in climate change, it's been a smallish number of countries that have created all of this mess, but we have to stop everybody and change the way we do it, the smaller countries will say, well, wait a minute, you're actually not allowing us to do and develop in the way others have. And it's the same mm -hmm. with space. space. Most of this debris, most of these satellites have been put together, put up there by a relatively small number of countries. Mm -hmm. If we then say, okay, now we've got to rethink who goes up, when, how, you know, that con is contrary to the treaty, which is freedom of access, but it's also in from a sort of moral ethical perspective, 
you're saying to smaller countries, actually, you don't have the same opportunity to develop your activities as the others have. And, mm. you know, those are really difficult arguments, but we've got to have conversations. Mm. Definitely, definitely. Um, just a slight clarification for, for some of our listeners. We'll talk about geostationary orbit earlier, geo, uh, and how we can run out of space in certain parts of that orbit. Um, for our listeners that aren't aware, geostationary orbit is where the satellite stays over the same part of Earth as the Earth rotates. So you can have a satellite that is uh, focused solely on Sydney or, or something like that. So you might run out of space um, with satellites that cover, say, Japan, which is a relatively small landmass, but relatively high um, space um, uh, technology in that country. Um, I'm going to move further away now than our robots <laughs> and I want to talk about the moon and then after that I want to ask you about Mars. Um, so the moon is very interesting. Um, we have the Artemis program now, um, a sister to the Apollo program that took us to the moon in the first place. Uh, we're looking to get a human presence back on the moon to set up moon bases, um, uh, mine on the moon um, and, and when I say mine we're looking at things like um, water ice that may be uh, in perpetual darkness in certain deep craters, particularly near the Southern Pole. Uh, and then long term, we want to build launch pads and launch from the moon and, and go to Mars. Um, what are some of the, I mean, I, I'm, I'm aware that no one can own a part of the moon, but what happens if, for example, America and China want to set up a moon base in exactly the same spot? What, what are some of the laws that govern that? And what are some of the things we're going to have to think about moving forward, given that we're going to have a, a longer, maybe permanent presence on the moon? Well, that's a great question. Firstly, the Outer Space Treaty has a lot to say that is relevant, and that will apply. There's also another treaty um, that we call the Moon Agreement. Australia is a party to that, but if, if you like, none of the really major spacefaring nations are. But I mentioned that I've been honoured by the UN. The UN, you know, all the countries are interested in exactly that question, right? Because there's great interest now in specific types of naturally occurring resources, let's say on the moon and other celestial bodies. And so there is a UN agency called COPOS, you mentioned it before, a Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. It sets up uh, ways of developing laws and rules of the road. They do that by way of setting up working groups. There are not many, but they've set up a working group, which is called, it's a technical thing, it's called the Working Group on Legal Aspects of Space Resource Activities. 105 countries are sitting in that working group, and I've been honoured by being appointed by COPOS as the co-chair. I have a five-year mandate. As part of our mandate, we've got a, a lot of things to do, but part of our mandate is to get Everything by consensus, those 105 countries, and by the time I finish my five years, it'll probably be 110, 115, to agree by consensus on a set of principles which will augment and add to the already existing space law that we have, because the already existing space law that we have, as good as it is, maybe isn't specific enough for some of the questions that you raise. And in fact, in the next six months, the 105 countries have asked me and my co-chair, who's an ambassador in Poland, we will be writing the first draft, we call it a zero draft, of the rules, right? And then we will present that to the, to the UN and the countries in March. And then between March 25 and July 27, there will be negotiations and discussions. We will have 50, 100 meetings of the 105 countries where our draft will be renegotiated and renegotiated and renegotiated so that hopefully, hopefully, um, by consensus, we'll agree principles. So that is mm -hmm. the way it works. And even though people might say that's a slow process, firstly, it's not slow. Uh, we're making remarkable progress given the world we're in and how we need to operate by consensus, but we are moving forward. Secondly, we're not going to have major space resource activities for a long time. We still don't actually, we're not at that point. But thirdly, we've got to get it right. Because whatever rules we put in place, be you know, in whatever form they are agreed through this multilateral process, they have to last not for one or two or five years, but for mm. 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And so, and they have to be specific enough, but flexible enough. They have to be accepted by all so that again, even if two countries or groups of countries don't necessarily like each other, they don't they compete or whatever, 
if they're operating at the, on the same rule book, then that, that, that they've all had the opportunity to contribute to in terms of the way it's been developed, then they are much, much more likely to comply. And therefore, we minimise risks of misunderstandings and miscalculations, which of course would be a disaster. Mm. So there's a lot of work. It's a work in progress. The mm. governance of space continues to be a work in progress as we do more and more. But we, again, have to ensure that we look at it holistically, not necessarily just from one perspective, but from many perspectives, because it is, in the end, about humanity. Mm. And it's a, a pardon the pun, it's an astronomical task that we <laughs> have. <laughs> um, and, and really, I mean, the, the world is, is sort of, I don't know, six, seven, eight years into a new space race, and, and it's driven more by private interests, and, and a lot more things are going up into space, and a lot more countries are having access to space than they would have had 30, 40 years ago. Uh, so building those laws that work for everybody, uh, work for a long enough time, and are both specific enough and flexible enough is a very, very difficult task. Um, but as you said, it's not moving slowly. We're doing a lot of great work with it. We are. All right, I, I want to move a little bit further further out now. I want to go to Mars. Um, <laughs> the aim is to get to Mars. Is there any difference in the law between, say, the moon and the law on Mars? Uh, I mean, uh, one being a moon, one being a planet, I would imagine, shouldn't have too much effect on the law. Um, but there are, are there any more challenges when it comes to the concept of, of setting up um, bases and then laws on Mars? So the internet, it's a great question. The international rules that we have, when they talk about they, they always talk about the moon and other celestial bodies in one phrase. So mm -hmm. there's no difference if from an international law perspective, by and large, you know, mm -hmm. there's no difference between the moon and any other celestial body, at least in our solar system. So that would include mm -hmm. Mars. But Mars raises, and, and even the moon raises interesting issues, let us say, if we are moving and destined to move towards a, 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 a human presence, let us mm -hmm. say, on the moon or, you know, way out on Mars. Now, I, I don't express a view as to whether I think that's possible or it makes sense, but humanity is curious and that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. We need to clearly begin to understand what how, how humans interact, what laws will govern humans. Imagine on Mars in 100 years' time, we have uh, a group of 20 people, and ideally 20 people from 20 different countries form that first mission, right? What law will apply to, to them? Now, we have the international law about the activity itself, but, you know, Nathan and Stephen have to interact, right? Mm. And humans will take their own frailties and flaws. Not that you have any flaws, Nathan, <laughs> but, I, but I have many, right? And, I have a and, few too. <laughs> Humans will want to get married, right, and have kids and kill each other. And, you know, it, I, I exaggerate to make a point that, you know, amongst many, many other issues, if we are serious about having humans living permanently off Earth, and, of course, we've had humans in space for the last 20 years on the space station, I understand that, but that's a sort of ad hoc thing. But if we're talking about permanent presence, let us say on Mars, where it's inconceivable that they can return. We'll have to work out what their rights are, though. Mm. We'll have to work out what the interactions are, because, of course, you know, it's not Australian law or US law or Chinese law or Russian law or Indian law that will apply. Even if you've got one national from each of those countries, it doesn't make sense to have different laws in such an area where we're all dependent on each other. So we will have to work out, if it gets to that, how humans are going to survive and what laws will apply to them in their interaction, especially if they're in an environment where, by and large, it'll be very difficult for them to come back. You know, not impossible if you believe the scientific things, the science fiction things we see on on TV, but mm -hmm. that is a long way off. You know, someone goes mm -hmm. to Mars, they are there for a long time. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a tough place to be. And really, I will want to make sure that, Nathan is doing absolutely the right thing and you want to make sure that I'm doing absolutely the right thing because if either of us are acting under different rules, then that's a disaster for all of us. So, mm. you know, there's, it's an interesting thing because we've got to work out how humans will survive in that sort of environment and 
you know, I think a lot of people are looking at habitat, they're looking at protection from radiation, they're looking at the psychology of that, you know, they're looking at, you know, all of those things, but we need to understand that and people need to understand that, you know, it's not a given that humans will be able to, to survive in an environment like that. Mm. And it's certainly we'll need at that minimum to have common rules, but then there are a whole range of other issues as well. Mm. There, are, there are so many technical challenges about um, living and, and traveling in space, but uh, a lot of it comes down to um, not, not the challenges to survive, but for the laws, our basic humanity and, and the way we exactly. are as people. Yeah. Um, now, we, I, I want to make sure that we get some time to go to some of our uh, online questions here. Um, and I've got a, a couple of them are, are asking a little bit about um, your background and, and um Oh, so I've got one here actually, and, and I did want to touch on this again. Um, so uh, this person has said, um, uh, you said you were an actor. How did you go from actor <laughs> to lawyer to academic and more? And I personally would like to add on to that. Can you tell us about some of your acting work? Oh, well, it's, uh, it's um, I, 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 you know, I was always, I studied law at the university, law and economics, but mm. I did quite a bit, quite a bit of acting and then I took a couple of years I had a job lined up and I took a couple of years off and thought um, I'll see what I could do with this and I ended up going to London and actually did a bit of work on the west end of London but that was a million years ago in the early 80s mm -hmm. when uh, when the economy in the UK was not as it is now and um, I had the opportunity to essentially not become a lawyer even though the job was waiting for me but my uh, erstwhile employer said, you know, you've got to come back now after two years. I had the opportunity to stay and continue my acting career, but a lot of um, West End and other theatres actually closed in the period I was in London. And I thought maybe this doesn't quite make sense for me from a long term survival perspective. Um, but I think, you know, I, I feel sometimes in my work, it's all about communication. A lot of what I do is communication. A lot of diplomacy is about communication. A lot of being an academic is being communication. A lot about being a lawyer is communication. A lot of being putting transactions together as an investment banker. Life is about communication. And so acting, you know, is a skill. Um, but it, you know, it certainly helped, I think, helped me be a reasonably good communicator, which I think, you know, people can have the best CDs in the world, be the smartest people in the world, write the, the most brilliant things. But if they can't impart a message, if they mm -hmm. can't communicate, if they can't inspire, if they can't captivate and, and make people interested, then in a sense, you know, that's probably not ideal. So mm. acting, you know, I was never going to be an actor for the whole of my life, I don't think. I was not that good. <laughs> but I, I gave it a go and it was fun. And But it, it sort of has helped that skill has helped me i think in all the other things i've done wonderful um now i've got a, a couple of questions here that are very similar uh we've got one from a high school student here um that uh, wants to know how you got your start in space law uh and also uh this student wants to know um uh, it's their dream to work for the united nations and and how to go about that <laughs> so um yeah how, how how specifically did you get into uh, space law and if someone did want to do some work with the un what sort of study and then career path would you recommend Absolutely. I think it's a great question. So, look, uh, everything I've done in my professional career outside of acting, you know, as an international commercial lawyer, as an investment banker, um, as an academic, has been of an international nature. I've had the pleasure of living in many countries and working in even more. So everything I was going to do was about international. Um, mm -hmm. Therefore, international law became interesting for me. Um, I, uh, after retiring so to speak in my early 40s after investment banking I went back and did some study I did a master of law in uh, in the Netherlands the University of Utrecht in the late 1990s and somebody was teaching space law there and I oh, thought in the oh, 90s my. yeah the, a, oh, wow. a, a guy called Vivo Hervé uh, I'm not sure whether he's still alive but he taught he taught space law and I thought this is interesting so uh, I did it and of course was captivated with the idea and of course learned many things that I didn't know before and then I having lived overseas for many years I came back to Australia and became an academic and I took 
baseball back with me and was one of the first. I think there were one or two others at the time, but one of the first to um, introduce base law at university. And at the time, this is the very early noughties, you know, people were scratching their heads and there was a bit of laughter and there was a lot of uh, ignorance. But funnily enough, Australia already had space law by then. We had national space law from 1998. Um, and uh, it, it really just grew from there because space, space technology, space innovation, space creation, space economy, it impacts on everything, every facet of our lives. And so there's more and more recognition of that and not that many people really who have had the breadth, you know, I've been very lucky. I've done this for 25 years, you know, space as well as other things. And uh, I'm very lucky that I'm in that position. In terms of working for the UN, well, you know, uh, they're, they're, I'm not a diplomat. In fact, I'm the only person that COPWAS has appointed to chair a working group that is not a full-time diplomat, which I think is a bit of a compliment to me, but it very much so. allows me to be independent to a certain degree. But of course, um, I'm an Australian. I've represented Australia um, at, at the United Nations through my expertise and then being appointed by DFAT and the, the agency. If you want to work at the UN, be involved in that. And let's say you're living in Australia, um, probably the quote unquote easiest way, and it's not easy, but the most direct path would be to work uh, for DFAT or uh, the agency perhaps, or... Um, so, so, sorry, could, could you just yeah. uh, um, <clears throat> expand on DFAT? Oh, for our excuse audience? me. Yeah, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. So mm -hmm. our Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in other countries, but mm -hmm. ours also combines trade. My apologies. Um, so DFAT, of course, uh, represents us, you know, is the ministerial department that is engaged mainly in representing Australia at the United Nations. And there are many, 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 many different UN agencies. Space is just one of them. Um, so if you had a career with DFAT, you probably, depending on what you did, you know, studying law, studying international relations, and also studying sciences, you know, all of those things are really helpful when it comes to space and stand you in good stead in terms of being able to um, speak with authority uh, on behalf of your country at the UN. But of course, it's not just about space at the UN. The UN is so much broader than that. So there are many opportunities and everybody should follow what they're interested in. Delightful. We, we often say in the centre here that um, there are so many jobs in space that you can take almost any job title and add the word space at the beginning of it and it's going to work. Um, I just want to finish up. We've got a lovely uh, slideshow of some pictures here. Um, and this may go into a, one last question we had uh, from online is out of everything you've done, what is your favorite? Um, could you perhaps talk us through some of these uh, these photos and, and some of your happy memories from a very illustrious career that you've had? Well, you make it sound, Nathan, that I'm at the end of my career. I still think... Uh, oh, no, just so far, so far. <laughs> I, 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 do you know something I don't know? Or something <laughs> that, um, oh, look, I, I, they asked me uh, to put some photos together, so I've just got a, a bit of a mix here. Where there's the, On the top right is my darling wife. Uh, that's when I got my PhD. Um, the top left, you know, I do a lot of work in many countries there as I getting an award uh, it, there in the UAE. The bottom left is uh, giving a class on National Science Day, I think it was, to uh, primary school kids on space. The middle one on the bottom is the latest meetings of uh, the United Nations. And if you go very, very, if you look at the photo, that's me on the screen. I've got the, I'm chairing the meeting. The bottom right, uh, my favourite jigsaw puzzle is the moon, oh, and I, that's a big and one. <laughs> it's a big one. So uh, uh, the middle photo on the top, uh, somebody I, I did an interview for someone, and she very kindly did a drawing of me. Um, there's another slide, I think. Uh, if uh, it, uh, thanks, and so it's more of the same, but with a bit of a food theme here. Um, the middle top, um, you know, I I have relationships, and I have to garner relationships with all the countries of the world in my work and so I often engage in what I call Tim Tam diplomacy because <laughs> uh, everybody knows about Tim Tam, well they do now and so that middle um, slide on the top 
uh, to my right is uh, the one of the senior officials from Switzerland, and to my left was uh, someone who was at that time in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in in Russia. She she's now no longer there, uh, and so there's Tim Tams being presented, uh, and then some other photos. The one on the top right is. Uh, when our wedding photo, our wedding invitation, uh, when Donna and I got married, I'm not great in the water. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> you can see I was uh, struggling. Um, I'm a great Arsenal supporter and Geostation in Orbit allows me to watch Arsenal uh, live on TV. So far, so good this year, but they'll find a way to a, lose. It's been a good start um, to the season. Yeah. And I like running, running, although I'm getting a bit old now. So I've done quite a few, uh, I think about 15 or so half marathons. So these are just a montage of who I am. And, you know, it's nice that um, you're able to express yourself as a human being as well mm. as doing all these things. And again, that's part of communication. You know, I find at the diplomatic level, at the academic level, in my interactions with people around the world, that people don't want, they, they want to see you as human being. Mm. And, you know, you can find many things to talk about of interest that allow you then to move forward, you know, and my job is to bring people together, bring the countries together, you know, have many conversations on the fringes of meetings to try to work out where this common interest is. And it could be football and it could be food and it could be running or it could be anything like that as a starting point. And out of that building a bond, you're able to begin to build a consensus, or at least the environment for possible consensus, because that's what it's all about. And, you know, we are all humans. There isn't actually a lot of difference uh, amongst us around the planet. Um, clearly, we operate under different um, uh, cultures and different traditions, etc., and obviously different geopolitics, but we are all human beings and we all have this incredible wonder in and, and dependence upon space. And I think that's a really powerful thing. I think that's a, a, a wonderful spot for us to, to leave it on. Our, our commonality really helps build bridges um, and, and bonds and, and those ties. Um, Tim Tam diplomacy, I think, is going to be one of my favourite things coming out of this. Um, sadly, we have come to the end of our time here. Um, I would just like to thank uh, Stephen Freeland. Stephen, this has been an absolutely delightful conversation. Thank you. Thank your you. work, your career um, is, is quite impressive. And I see from your personality and your communication skills why you are so good at this. Um, thank thank you. you for all the work you've done and all the work you'll continue to do. And thank you very much for having a chat with us today. It was an absolute pleasure. Oh, it's been a delight. And, and you know, it's things like this that add to people's interest in space. What you're doing and what the Discovery Centre does is extraordinary and important. And, uh, you know, so I thank you. And it's been, it's a pleasure and an honour for me to be able to share these reflections with you. But um, let's speak again over a beer. Oh, if I'm allowed to say that, over I'm, a beer when I'm next in Adelaide. I'm keen for that. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you to all of uh, those of you who have joined in online for our digital Q&A. Um, you will be able to find this up on uh, YouTube and via our socials at uh, some point. Um, and again, if anyone is in Adelaide, please come and visit us on Lot 14, um, just next to the Botanical Gardens. You can learn all about space. Uh, we're all massive space nerds here. We will chew your ear off about it. Um, but for now, that is the end of our digital Q&A. Uh, thank you once again, Stephen, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.